right. So my name is Carson Tate, and I am I fill a few roles with Bold Strokes Books. One of them is author, <laughs> and I also coordinate um, the events in conjunction with Rad and Sandy. Um, so I'm just going to go around the room and um, call on people and have them introduce themselves and tell you, tell us what they do for Bold Strokes Books. And let's start with hmm. Let's start with this woman named Radcliffe, <laughs> aka Len Barrow. <laughs> Thanks, Carson. Um, I'll I'll keep it simple now because I don't want to kind of um, move into what other folks are doing because sometimes I wear more than one hat. But as the publisher, I guess maybe you could think of me as the conductor because I think that everything we do is a joint effort and somebody kind of has to coordinate things, but I kind of like conductor better than coordinator. Sounds, you know, a little bit more artistic. But my job is to kind of make sure that all the moving parts work together so that we can make a book when all is said and done. And part of, there's, a, I have a whole list of things that go into making a book and I can talk about that a little bit later. But I counted up um, as I was sitting here waiting, how many people touch a book during our production process, from the moment that we start the acquisition process until we actually bring the book to print and then market the book and promote the book is what we call the post-production stage. And it's 26 individual people. And part of publishing is, in my, to my mind, getting the best people to do those jobs. And I think that's what we have here. And um, some of the folks are going to talk to you tonight about exactly what, what pieces they touch in this process. 26. So when you said conductor, I was thinking train conductor, but you were thinking. <laughs> like, <laughs> train conductor. No, I see. If, if you're going to talk about trains, then I have to be the engineer. <laughs> the driving person. All right. Now that we've got our terminology straight, <laughs> I'm going to move on to um, Sandy Lowe. Tell us what Hi you everybody. do. Um, I'm Sandy. Obviously, I'm sure most of you have seen far too much of my face this weekend. Um, my role is um, senior editor, and that means basically that I work directly with Rad um, here at the BSB office. Um, right here, she and I work together. Um, and my role is kind of like chief operating officer. Um, I guess the hands on day to day running of the business um, and managing, you know, all those, all those 26 various people um, that have a role um, in making our books. Um, I do a little bit of everything. I create our um, schedule. So I decide when, when the books are going to come out um, and all everything that kind of goes into that prep stage with all the contracts and um, making sure that we're kind of ready to send the books to the editors, um, to things like this, um, you know, helping with the events and kind of helping to, um, helping grab with like being kind of the face of um, Bold Strokes in a way and working with all our authors. Um, if one of our authors gets an email from someone at BSB, it's almost always me <laughs> or their editor. Um, so I often introduce myself as, hi, I'm the person who writes the emails. Um, so that's that's a little bit of what I do. Awesome. So, um, Tony, talk to us about what you do for Bold Strokes. Okay. Um, I guess I, what I would say is I take those wonderful books that all you guys are writing and I put them in a in a format that those people that prefer the electronic versions um, uh, get to have. So I'm the ebook person, so I do either the, the development and I also do the um, for some. Uh, location to distribution. So make sure they get to the places like Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and things like that so that they're available for people to purchase. Very important. You're the reason we can carry 400,000 books around in one device. <laughs> and we appreciate that. Um, Jenny, tell us what you do for Bold Strokes. Hi, everybody. Um, I've been doing different things for Bold Strokes for a pretty long time now, and I've done everything from read submissions to um, beta read, and um, I also proofread. And um, my, my idea of where the proofreader fits is kind of on the, on the train or whatever we're on here. Um, 
it, it starts with the author, then acquisition by the publishing company, and then it goes into editing. And then in, at the end of editing, before it goes to production, the proofreader comes in and um, looks at the, um, the finished page proofs before the typesetter gets them. And so that's what I do. And it's really um, just a matter of careful, slow reading. Um, I try to make myself word, read word for word, if not line for line, to look for any kinds of typos or errors. Um, sometimes I lose my way if I'm proofreading for a favorite author and I realize I haven't found an error for 145 pages or something like that. But, um, you know, that's, that's basically what the proofreader does before it goes to the typesetter. That's a real double-edged sword. We really want you to carefully read our work, but we want you to be so engrossed that you don't. Yeah, it happens a lot, actually. <laughs> and Ruth Sternglance, tell us about, you, you fulfill a few different roles, so. Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I get to work on both sides of, of production. I, my first role at BSB is as, is as an editor. Um, but at a certain point, um, at a certain point, I said to Red, you know, if I'm going to be caring about commas, I also want to make sure that these books get sold and that as many people as possible can buy the books. Um, and I got involved in marketing. So I've been doing editing and marketing. I also, um, I also do a lot of sort of things that people don't see um, behind the scenes. I work a lot in the web store. Um, I work a lot with customer service. I work, I basically do anything Red asks me to do. <laughs> That's basically my role. That's basically my role. Raise your hand if you do anything Red asks you to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the whole idea of being a conductor, right? <laughs> oh. You see the woodwinds go, no, forget it, we're not going to play that part. Um, can, can, I, um, can, I, can I do my... Absolutely. Work? Yeah, can I? I, I asked Carson to ask me a question, which was, well, what does it take to make a book? Can I do that one? Absolutely. Only because everybody has mentioned their part, and I just thought it would be really helpful, because I don't think that we as consumers really get the gist of what it takes to make a book. And so I was just going to very briefly just go through the stages so that you could get a sense of how many people are involved and what happens um, from the point that the author finishes the book and pushes send to the publisher. This is kind of what happens. Um, the very first step is what we call acquisition, which is when the books are reviewed. And that's when the manuscripts are read by, for us, usually a collection of people. We, we use both professional editors to review the books as well as accomplished, experienced readers who have shown that they really love this kind of work, are familiar with the genre, and are willing to read the books and critique them from a reader's point of view because, um, Often what we think works really well doesn't work for a reader or what we think might need work, readers really love. So it helps us balance what kind of manuscripts we're gonna take. So that's the acquisition stage. And after we find a manuscript that we would like to publish, we offer a contract and that has to be negotiated. So that usually involves another couple of people including our attorney, Paula Teig. Um, once the contract is in place, that's when um, Sandy who works with contracting as well as many other things, we'll schedule the book for publication. Um, so we know where the slot is. Then we have to assign an editor who's gonna edit the book. And usually there's at least, there's usually two, there may be one or there may be two, depending on the nature of the work. So at that point, this is all what we call pre-publication. Then the editorial stage is happening in one part of the orchestra. And at the same time, in another part of the orchestra, we're doing the cover graphics, which we will need to promote the book pre-pub. We're getting the metadata ready, which is all the information that Ruth needs to make sure that these titles get listed with various places like Amazon and Barnes and Noble, 
Um, every place that will buy the book and sell the book needs information, which we call metadata. So this is happening in another part of the orchestra pit. Um, and we are getting together marketing materials for the distributors. And Cindy Cressip, who's not here, who is our production manager, is involved in that along with Sandy and Ruth. Um, basically, every title needs kind of like a little sell sheet that tells the distributors everything about it. And all of this happens while editing's going on in another part of the room. Um, so that's what we call the pre-pub part. And then once the work is edited and it's moving through the production schedule, hopefully on time, always on time, <laughs> trains are always on time. Um, once it's edited, and that's usually multiple stages, then it gets proofed as Jenny was talking about. We will usually um, proofread it, then it gets typeset and the typeset work gets proofed again, fi a final go over so that we make sure everything looks good before it gets printed. And one of the formats that gets generated at that stage goes to Tony, in fact, several of them do. And then Tony picks it up and an ebook is not formatted the same way as a print book. It doesn't work that way at all. The flow is really different. And I don't understand any of that stuff. Tony just knows all that stuff. Um, and if we didn't have Tony, we'd be in the soup. Um, and she also has readers who proof it, right, Tony? So that um, they can actually look at the ebook for flow and see if there are problems and gaps and spaces because it's a totally different process. So that's going on in another part of the room. And the book hasn't even come to publication yet. So that's working. We've got a file that goes off to the printer, which Sandy sends off and tells them how many copies that we need to have printed and where those copies need to go. So that's happening before the book even gets to the store that hopefully all are gonna buy it. Um, in this process, we've loaded information onto the web store so that you can see them and Ruth and Sandy are busy doing that so that before publication, the books are there and you can read the blurbs and you can decide if you would like it. And once we get to the pub date, then we start promoting the work. And that's where we advertise and we have reviewers look at it. Um, the authors get involved in letting all of you know that their works are out there. And that's why basically that's what we call the post-publication stage. And that's when you keep selling the book. It's not enough to just get it there on the date of publication. You need to keep putting the book out just like we're doing now and talking to you throughout this bookathon about the various things that our authors have done and will be doing. So that's kind of like the, the stages of making a book and that's why I counted up 26 plus hands, pairs of hands that touch this book, so. And that doesn't include the audio book component if you're. It doesn't, if we're doing an audio book, kind of like in 2010 is when we moved very quickly into eBooks and that's when you know, Tony's whole, whole division kind of got developed to start doing ebooks to bring out on the pub date. And the audiobooks, it's an entirely new format and it's a different format, just like ebooks are different than print books. So with the audiobooks, we're auditioning narrators. We are um, preparing the script for them, which is the, it has to be the proofed final Word document. Most of them will use Word documents because they will prepare their scripts by actually editing what they're gonna read. Um, so that has to be a final before we can get it to the narrator. Um, the narrators, depending on how fast they, were, they, they work, may take a few weeks or a couple of months, depending on how fast they are. And then we'll get back the rough files and we have separate proof listeners who will listen to it and proof it. Um, and then they'll come back to us with changes, which goes back to the narrator who will then change their files. And once we're done, it goes to ACX, which is the Audible production arm, where they basically do a Q&A on all the files to make sure that they meet the right sound requirements. So that's an entirely, you know, that all has to be contracted, scheduled, produced, covers. Um, so that's basically a third production arm that we've just added in the last two and a half years. And we've done 250 titles in two and a half years. Audio titles. Wow. Audio titles. Wow. That's a lot. So, um, so I'm, we're getting lots of comments and questions. Um, 
one is how you know how long does it take from acceptance to publication generally um and i'll direct that to sandy sure um it depends on sorry excuse my dog in the background um it depends on whether it is um an author's first book so they submit their first manuscript to us through our website um, or whether the author is already in-house because the proce processes are slightly different. Um, usually the longest road to publication will be the first book because the author has already written the draft um, and is waiting for us to, um, to read it and to make a decision on it um, before it ever hits the schedule. Um, so there's that extra time in the beginning, um, you know, with the writing of the draft and the waiting for an acceptance that adds time to the process. So for that first manuscript, we try to make it about 12 months, um, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, depending on what else is on our schedule. If the author is already in-house, uh, we have a different process called a proposal, um, which is, you know, fortunately or unfortunately not a marriage proposal, slightly <laughs> more boring than that. <laughs> Um, but Melissa Braden is writing a book called Marry Me, so I feel like that one could go either way. Anyway, um, that um, is a bit faster because the author will basically pitch their idea to me. So they send me a document that says, I want to write a book and it's about this and it has these characters and here's my story. Um, what do you think? And then we'll go back and forth a little bit um, on that. Make sure it's something that uh, makes sense and that fits our brand and fits the author's brand. Um, and then I will contract the book at that stage before the author has even started writing the draft. Um, so the author can be writing their draft while we are doing all those um, pre-production stages that Rad was just talking about. We do this simultaneously once the author is in-house and that um, makes things a little faster. It takes about nine months then. So just, I wanted to take a minute and ask all of you to tell me um, what's your favorite thing, part about what you do and, and why. Um, and I'm gonna start with you, Jenny, because you know, proofreading is not my favorite thing at all. <laughs> and so um, I have much admiration and respect for those who do it and do it well as I know you do. <laughs> well, well, um, I, I love being a proofreader and I think I'm okay at it. You know, I do, you know, I think sometimes I'm better, you know, I see some errors more clearly than others, but I really love just being a part of the process of making a book the best that it can be. And, um, you know, just being a, a little help in that process is, you know, is a really gratifying thing. And I learn a lot from the other people that, um, you know, I work with at BSB and, um, but I also really love to get to see the books before everybody else in the world gets to see them. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, so that's a, a big bonus of this job. <laughs> Definitely. I, I've had um, my editor, and who's also the production manager, Cindy, um, comment to me that sometimes the proofreaders who've read all of my books will catch consistency things, too, mm -hmm. you know, because they've read them all. Yeah. Sometimes there are little things like that that you catch if you are familiar with someone's work or, you know, those kinds of errors sometimes or those kinds of facts will stick with you. And I have a few um, books that I or readers or authors that I read that I do that for. So, yeah, we, we appreciate you very much. It's like way much extra brain power. <laughs> so, um, Tony, how about you? What's your favorite part of making ebooks? Um. You know, I kind of I have to go back to the beginning. And actually, you know, Rad, it was actually 2008. Believe it or not, I found the original email wow. where, you know, back in the day, most a lot of people probably know back in the day, you know, there were Yahoo groups. And when 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 BSB first opened the web store, um, they sent an announcement out about that they were going to be doing ebooks. And in and, and that announcement they say yeah we get, you know we're working on our backlist and you know we'll get them out as fast as we can well several years beforehand i was had already started playing around with ebooks just for my own personal use um mainly the uh fan fiction that was online and things like that i don't like reading on a laptop anything like that and there were already tools out there that you can take 
you know, word docs and create your own ebook. So, you know, I shot off already being a big fan of Bo's jokes and big fan of writing all that shot off an email saying, Hey, you know, I've been doing this for a while. So if you guys need some help, let me know. And I think it was just a couple of hours that I got a response back. It was probably five minutes. <laughs> and Rat was like, uh, yeah, sure. Like I said, this was in January of 2008 that this all transpired. And so it really, the whole thing kind of, it brought together my love of both strokes and my love of the authors that were there and reading and stuff like that. And it brought that together with my being a geek already because I was a I'm a developer by trade so it just it was a it was a marriage made in heaven for me so I got to help out people that I had learned you know had met and really liked and and a, a company that I really loved and so it was it was a joy for me I mean I was like I was geeking out so much the fact that I was actually going to be able to do this and then like Jenny said you know there's the bonus of being able to get to see this stuff first you know and so a lot of times I had to make sure that I didn't spend too much time reading and actually doing the work that I was supposed to be doing you know to get these ebooks out there so you know it's it's, it's just been great it's been a wonderful experience for me so well you know the other side of that bonus is when um the Kindle came out before the iPad. Yep. And the formats were different from what we'd been using. And when this all happened, it was in the fall. It was probably September or October, I think, Tony. And, yeah. I, and I said, this is going to be big. And I would like you to convert all our titles <laughs> as, as fast as you can. Yep. And she did it in six weeks. And there must have been a thousand by then. Wow. So that, that's the other side of the bonus part, you know, is that I'd like you to do this tomorrow, would you? <laughs> yeah. And, and then, and it was just, it wasn't just, uh, you know, then it kept more and more came, started coming out, you know, Apple and Barnes and Nobles and everybody. And believe it or not, I mean, you probably don't know this, but there a lot of these formats don't play well together and a lot of these devices don't play well together. You can have yeah. the same file and you can have one on an iPad and one on something else and they can look totally different. So that, that can, that's very frustrating too, because I try when I'm working on these books, I try to get the experience as close for all the devices I can so that everyone has the same experience, but it's, it's just not possible. And some people, some even today there's some of the newer kindles that can do things better than the older kindles can mm -hmm. do but if you don't make a file that's compatible for both then somebody's going to get shortchanged so i can't take advantage of some of the cool stuff that the new kindles can do without hurting the older kindle so you know it's a it's a balancing act but it's it's still fun yeah i think i think one more thing about ebooks is that what a lot of people don't realize is that our ebooks are available on just about every device and and platform available nationally and internationally. And as Tony said, not only are there little differences so that one file doesn't fit all, but Tony has to keep track of uploading all these files every month, every new title every month to multiple platforms, which it, and getting there on time um, every month. And then of course, you know, there's when I show up and say, can I have this two weeks early? Because, you know, I need it. Yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand if Rad has asked you for something with five minutes notice. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, how many books is that a month, usually, on average? Twelve. Twelve books, but multiple formats. Yeah. And we started with, like, four. So yeah. when I signed up for this, it was like four months. And it was like, you know, and then it, it kept growing and growing. And I was like, okay, okay, we can do this. <laughs> Sometimes when we're having a particularly hard day at the office, I'll turn to Rad and go, remember when we used to publish four books a month? <laughs> what do we do with the rest of our time? <laughs> well, as someone whose very first book came out as ebook only, I really appreciate you, Tony. And I remember the conversation we had because Carson, she's talking about the problems. That very first book of Carson's had four different fonts in it. I remember <laughs> it. 
<laughs> and if you don't realize it, ebooks don't like different fonts. And, you know, you, you talked about embedding fonts and then you get into licensing issues. And the first, and I remember it, we were in Mark's store and I, Carson, and I don't even think I said hello. And I was, all I said was, you were the one with four fonts in, in, in one book. And so it was, yeah. So that was my, uh, yeah, thank you for that, Carson. I really appreciate it. I think have provided you the experience. <laughs> As you can tell, it's a lot of this has been a learning experience because many, many times we've been the first to do something. And, you know, we've been, you know, we learn together. And yeah. so that's what makes us strong. We were, one of the, we were one of the first publishers to bring out print and ebooks simultaneously. Not just one of the first queer publishers, but one of the first publishers period. And yeah, mainstream publishing was a little late to get on the ebook um, on the digital wagon because they just move a lot more, they, they move more slowly. We can be much more facile because we have an orchestra that's really well tuned. We're nimble. It's stretch the analogy. <laughs> so Ruth, tell us what's your, what's your favorite part of your work with Bold Strokes and, um, and why? Well, I, I love making queer books. I mean, I love every aspect. I love every aspect of making queer books and I love being involved in not every aspect of, of the process at BSB, but in a lot of the, in a, in a lot of the aspects. Um, so I get to see, you know, I get to see the books first, but I also, I get to work with authors and I get to work with, um, I get to work with people in the outside world, um, with vendors and with reviewers and just, it's such, it's such a privilege to make queer books. It's such a privilege because these books have been so important to my life um, that, you know, getting, getting to be part of the process and part of the team at BSB, you know, and working with people that, I mean, I, the, the people on this screen, I have known and worked with collectively for probably close to hundred years, which, <laughs> which is a terrifying thought on some level, but it's also extraordinary. It's also extraordinary, and it's still kind of old now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, yeah. that's a great, great answer, Sandy. I'm going to toss this to you next because you know what's what's your favorite <laughs> part? You do so many different things. <laughs> sure. So I have two answers. Um, one is kind of more general. Um, my favorite part about my job in general is the people. Um, I think Ruth hit the nail on the head. Um, part of the reason I took this job was because I knew just for me personally that I really needed a queer community. Um, and this is a great queer community. You know, the, as Ruth said, the people that we work with are amazing, but also the broader queer community that we come in contact with at all the events and all the readers and our authors. Um, it's just really nice to have this, this network of LGBTQ people that you know and that you interact with um, kind of really embedded in your life. Um, I think it just for me personally, it makes it um, a lot more fun to be gay, honestly. <laughs> um, in, terms of my, in terms of my job, I think my favorite thing is paying royalties because I like <laughs> all our money. <laughs> I, like, I like to be Santa and I like to, you know, write those really nice checks. Um, <laughs> Red's like, don't say that. Um, <laughs> but honestly, that's just fun for me. I love to, you know, to share with the authors what they have earned. Um, you know, it's their, it's their book that we're selling and it's their work. And it's just really fulfilling for me to be able to send them a check and say, here, this is, you know, this is what you earned from your, you know, sweat and tears and congratulations. Oh. You didn't say that two weeks ago when you were writing 200 and something <laughs> checks. Uh, <I> <laughs> well, as an author, we appreciate that very, very much. <laughs> 
and it and, and it is a finely tuned machine when it comes to that part of it and that's something we really appreciate as well so um this is this is a good way to bounce into this question so on the business side of things um how does the process work i mean you do the royalties um and so someone someone asked you know how does it work as far as advances and royalties and then has COVID-19 impacted um, the financial status of book selling? Well, that's a personal question for sure. It um, is, but you know, overall, I mean, I think it's a good question about whether or not this yeah. pandemic has- Well, I, I, I can actually, I can speak for us and I can speak for publishing at large because there's a lot of information coming out. Um, I really had absolutely no idea what would happen. Um, there's is there's just no way to know to predict when there's something that is that is literally turned the entire world upside down i mean it was clear that the economy was really going to take a big hit what would happen um and we have not seen a major decline in sales which has been very encouraging however in publishing you can only project so far forward in terms of what kind of income you're going to have. And again, what most people don't realize is that our vendors, almost all of them, have what we call a 90-day net, which means if they sell a book in January, they don't have to pay us till April. So we have put all the money into making the book and marketing the book and publishing the book and then they sell the book and they get the money, but we don't get the money. So we don't, everything is pushed forward. So, you know, I know pretty well what we're going to get for the next two or three months because I know what we just sold in the last two or three months, but I don't know what we're going to sell in November, which means I don't know what we're going to make next January. So there's a, it's a rolling forward kind of looking at your capital. So you have to be, as a publisher, you have to be very careful that you watch your list, um, you see what's selling, or what's not selling, and you see, you know, I've, I have seen other publishing companies get in huge trouble when Amazon has done anything to disrupt this, the flow of sales. And they did that in um, March. They basically, um, they were having so much trouble fulfilling all their orders that they stopped ordering print books and they stopped fulfilling print books which um, killed the mainstream publishers who still sell more print books than eBooks. But fortunately for us, that's not true. We have a very healthy print you know, division, but eBooks continue to sell. So basically um, that, that has not hurt us so far. And it's just something that I watch literally every month as our new titles come out and we see what the backlist is selling, what we're gonna have going forward and we have to be prepared for that. Um, in terms of um, our basic, you know, setup, essentially um, we are an advance paying traditional publisher, which means that the bulk of our titles are contracted with an advance against royalties. Not all of them, it depends on the work, depends on the length of the work and a lot of other things, but probably 99.9% .9 of contracted titles, the author gets paid what we call an advance against royalties, which means they get a check, which is theirs to keep, whether they sell any books or not. Um, they never have to pay it back. Um, and then when the books start selling, depending upon the terms of their contract, they will generate royalties, which obviously they've already been paid some of those royalties up front. That's what an advance is. So they don't get any more money until the book sells enough to get past the money they've already been given. So that's something a lot of people don't understand. They think, oh, if I get a royalty and my, I mean, I get an advance and my books don't sell anything, I'll have to give it back. That's not true. Um, the authors make no zero financial investment in any of the books we publish. They, you know, there, there's no, nothing comes to us from the authors except the work and their hard work. So, so Jenny, quit trying to tell me I have to pay you to proofread. <laughs> Only in chocolate. <laughs> You've been busted. <laughs> so someone someone asked a question. Um, do uh, the authors make more money if people buy directly from Bold Strokes? 
And I think yes. that's what happens. Yes. The reason is there's nobody in the middle taking an enormous chunk out. Um, just, just for an example, Amazon takes 55% of retail price. So, bef and that's just one little piece of the puzzle. So the distributors take a chunk and the vendors, the final seller vendor takes a piece before we ever see it. So when we sell direct from the web store, the authors get a much bigger payout. So that's why we love it when you, when you come to the web store. It really helps the authors a great deal. And speaking of the web store, we're running um, a flash sale um, through the end of this bookathon. It's going on now. Um, if you've been watching these panels, you've seen a lot of authors. Their books are available um, in the web store at discounts. And if you're watching on your phone, here's the link that you should use because apparently you can't see it in the chat room. Really bookathon summer 2020. Woohoo! <clears throat> Also, I mentioned to you talking about sales um, because the authors and the publisher too makes more if you buy from the publisher. That's why we can offer um, sales and discounts. Um, we have daily bargains, which is um, I have an, a different ebook every day for three ninety nine. Um, you can sign up and get those emails right to your inbox. Um, just sign up on our webpage. But we're able to to do those kinds of things and offer those to our customers um, because we don't have, um, you know, some middleman taking a big chunk out. So if that appeals to you, please do order from Bold Strokes. Excellent. Um, so Ruth, I mean, how do you balance your day between editing books and being a marketing person? How does that work for you? That is a good question. Um, it depends. It depends on the time of the month. Um, it depends on the phase of the moon. It depends <laughs> on how many books I have, you know, in the editing, um, in the editing shoot. I, I would say that generally I do certain marketing and web store things first thing in the morning uh, because there are certain things that have to be done every single day and because we have customers all over the planet in every time zone um, there are certain things that just need to get done and I do that first thing in the morning and then I tend to edit because I like you know I know I know how my brain works and then I do more marketing um, that's basically but a lot of this is about a lot of juggling different roles is about being flexible. And sometimes, you know, sometimes we have an event and a new, a new thing that has to get done and it just, it has to get done and the things get done. Well, I know that I often email you at two in the morning and you often email me back right away. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes, um, C Cindy Cressip and I joke that one of us is always up. You know, Cindy is a night owl and I tend to be an early morning person. Um, um, but when Sandy was still in Australia, that, yeah. that's when I knew, that's when I knew that I had been working too long when I sent an email to Sandy and she replied right away. Because that meant like that the time zones had converged. Um, yeah, I've, I've run into that with the submissions committee. <laughs> Some of them are, are in Australia. So quick question, um, how, somebody asked, how long does it take to edit a book? Um, see, answer in like, 10 words. It, it completely depends. There is, there is no, there is, there is standard edit. You can edit the book that is in front of you. Some edits, um, some edits take 300 hours. Some edits take 75 hours. No, the same way no two books are the same, the same way no two authors are the same, no two books get edited in the same way. This is way more than 10 words. No, um, that's, that's, a, that's a fair answer. 
Jenny, a question came in for you. Do you proofread using paper copy, digital, or both? Um, I'm, I do it completely uh, digitally now. I don't, I, in the beginning, I occasionally would print out a book and do it that way, but that ended up always, I mean, that's obviously double work because if you do it on paper and have to transfer it. So I've accustomed myself to doing it completely um, on the computer. Do you I, I use an iPad and my Apple Pencil. Do, what do you I, use? I, no, I do, my, I do a laptop, and I just go through, and um, we, we transfer, or we, we see the correction in the um, page proofs, and we have a, um, a, a chart that we use to list um, by page number and by line, um, page number, paragraph, and um, line number um, to indicate where to look for the error um, for the typesetter. Do you read more than one at, at a time? No, I, it, when I'm proofreading, I, I mean, I'm always reading more than one book at a time, but when I'm proofreading, I just start at the beginning and go through. Um, I don't do more than one. Jenny, can, can I just ask Jenny, what, what do you look for as a proofreader? And I mean, what are the things that a proofreader is supposed to pick up? Um, the, the thing that a proofreader is supposed to pick up, we're supposed to look for um, errors. Um, mostly, you know, spelling and punctuation sometimes, and, um, you know, typos, those kinds of errors. And then beyond that, um, we um, might look for small errors in continuity, like Car Carson mentioned earlier, but something like if at the beginning of the book, the, the main character has blue eyes, and then somewhere in the middle, it turns into green eyes. And that doesn't happen very often. Most people have, you know, kind of found those errors themselves, but sometimes, or a character's name might change. But we don't, um, we don't correct, like we don't think, oh, I think this sentence would sound better if we used a different word. We don't do those kinds of, um, you know, suggestions. We just look for, you know, true mistakes. So. Sandy, um, here's a question that just, that came in. How many new authors do we add per year? Um, it varies a little, but not, a lot. I think last year we counted, Rad, you can correct me, it was about 13 to 15 new authors. Does that sound right? It's very consistent, actually. That's yeah. about, on average, for it's, it's just about 12 to 14 authors a year. Yeah. This works out that way. Like a month's worth of books. <laughs> well, we're, I mean, Carson, who, is his, who has not mentioned her role as our selection coordinator, our <laughs> submissions coordinator, we probably have, on a revolving basis, at least 20 active titles all the time going forward. Um, so it tells you how many look, books we're looking at and how many books we're actually taking. We get a lot of submissions. Yeah. Um, I would just encourage everyone to read the submission <laughs> criteria on the website. No, I mean, mostly because uh, sometimes people submit things that just aren't in our wheelhouse. Um, and it it might be on someone else's desk faster if, if you didn't come to us, but, but we definitely encourage submissions and we do have um, a publication initiative um, right now for um, black indigenous and people of color um, that we would encourage you to go to our website and check out. Um, there's a lot of great information on the website about submissions um, and we'd love to hear, hear from you and see your, see your, your books. So let's see, we answered that. And um, how do you know how many books to publish, Rad? You know, how many copies? Oh, huh. you should ask Sandy. She was just doing the print runs today. Um, <laughs> yes. Go ahead, Sandy, take that one. Sure. Um, we look at um, two things. One is an author's previous books. Um, especially if it's a series, that's a really good indicator. Um, see how many, many that author sells in print. Because um, remember, the print runs are only paperbacks. We're not talking about ebooks or audiobooks. Um, and some authors will sell better um, in ebook than print, and some will sell better in print than ebook. So looking at their past sales is really important. Um, the other thing we do is we look at comparable titles. Um, so if we have a book that's kind of sort of like another book that we think might appeal to the same audience. Uh, we look at those books together and kind of go up those sales to decide. Um, 
especially for debut authors too, looking at the comparable titles is um, really important. It's kind of more or less the only way we can kind of guesstimate what, um, what print run to choose. But the great thing about printing um, right now is that it is very efficient to reprint. Um, so we do try to get it right the first time because it is expensive to reprint. Um, but the book doesn't go out of print. If we run out of books, we can very um, quickly and simply um, re reprint a book if we run out of copies. And um, that's really helpful. So Rad, how do you decide which titles go into audio format? And can you talk a little bit more about audiobooks in general? If you well, the audio, the... Audiobooks in general are still a relatively small percentage of sales across the board in publishing, um, in both mainstream publishing and in queer publishing. Uh, it's still a very small percentage of what we sell. So partly that determines what kind, how many books and which books I will put into production because they're not selling in large numbers, um, but they are increasing. So it's a growing field, and I think it's going to continue to grow. So what we try to do is keep pace with a field that looks like it's becoming popular, especially since there's a lag time between when we can get an audiobook out relative to its general publication. So I look at, number one, is the genre popular? Is this something that audio listeners seem to be buying? Um, so that's number one or it's, it's A1, probably number one is, is the individual title popular? I mean, if a book has sold really well, or if that author sells really well, then that's an indication that it may sell well in a new format. Um, it's not always the case, but it's generally the case. So I will look at sales of the print and eBooks and when they reach a certain threshold so that there is clearly a market for this individual title, then that's something that pushes that title up in the list of books that we're gonna do as audiobooks. So I look at comparative sales for the author in general, for the, this particular title when it comes out. If I haven't already decided, if I don't already know that everything this author writes is gonna sell in audio, and there are some where that is the case, that they will automatically go into audio production the minute I have the final file in my hand. And we try to bring it out as close as we can to the publication date. But there will be authors, a new author, for example, who sells much bigger than I anticipated. And so that one I will bring out sooner because it appears to be quite popular. And I've brought out almost all the backlist of all of our top sellers already because I already knew they had a track record. So again, it's a, it's a title by title process. It's not necessarily automatic. It simply would not be cost effective. I mean, I can't, and no publisher can afford to publish something they can't sell. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the author if we don't sell it, and it doesn't help us if we invest in it and we can't sell it. But I think that as listeners begin to expand their listening experience, start to listen to things maybe that they haven't listened to before. It's just like anything else. It's like people love contemporary romances. I'm taking that as an example. And they think they don't like paranormals, but when they read them, they do. And the same thing is true in audiobooks. And I think that as the audience grows and as listeners begin to expand what they listen to, we can expand what we produce. So I'm always watching that. I love numbers. I look at the numbers every day. You do love numbers. And as an author, I appreciate you being on the cutting edge of things at all times. And um, so we've got just a minute or so. Um, do you, I mean, I, I think everybody can kind of speak to this. If, if someone's getting ready to submit a book, is there one piece of advice you could give them? Um, so we'll kind of go around the room. Um, I'm going to start with Ruth. Polish it as well as you can. Take the book as far as you can before you send it to us. Great answer. Jenny? Well, I would second that coming from a person in the middle of the process, but I think that it's really important for authors to 
you know, be in control of their own work and bring it to the best possible point that they can before um, they submit it to the, to the process that comes after, so. Tony, I think you're going to tell them not to use four fonts. Exactly. Absolutely. You knew that's where I was going. And also, don't no, don't use a lot of fonts and don't lose use a lot of emojis because they don't they don't work in ebooks either. <laughs> how, about ita- how about italics, Tony? Are italics a problem in no. ebooks? No. Okay, that's nope. good. Don't take all our fonts. <laughs> Sandy, I'll go to you and I'll let Rad have the last word. Sure. Um, my advice would be to ask questions. Um, if there's something that you want to know about us that's going to influence your decision about whether or not to submit us, we're very accessible. Um, please just, you know, just ask. Um, and again, if, if um, we accept your manuscript, um, you can ask all the questions. Any question that is in your head that you want to know, um, I'm usually the one that's going to answer it and I'm giving you permission. Um, so we would much rather um, have you ask and for you to feel comfortable having an answer than for you to kind of sit there anxiously wondering. Rad? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I second what everyone said and definitely what Sandy said. It's a big decision when you submit a work to a publisher. From a practical point of view, I screen, I see them first. I see everything that comes in first before it goes to Carson. and. It's very important for you to be able to present to the person that's going to review your synopsis or whatever you're presenting that you know what you've written. If you've written a romance, then you need to be able to succinctly in two or three paragraphs describe that work so that when I look at it, I think, huh, this sounds like an interesting story. I want to read this. So if you work really hard after you polish your manuscript, work really hard at the synopsis that you're gonna send in. So, and, and think about your book and think about what makes my book interesting and what makes my characters interesting and, put, and get that into a few paragraphs. Excellent. We could have obviously stayed here several hours to answer all these questions. Thanks to everyone who signed on to participate. We really appreciate you. Our next session is The Art of the Teas be a slightly different subject. And <laughs> so you can catch it on Zoom, uh, register through our website, or you can watch it on Facebook Live. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Thank evening. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye.